today is kind of spend time talking about um, issues that matter to us and how we cultivate space uh, for those issues in our lives. Um, I think a lot of times, um, and I don't know if this is more me or we kind of separate uh, the gospel from from the issues that we hold and we care about and that they are intimately uh, interwoven um, with uh, with with one another um, and so uh, today specifically that's what I want to talk about last week um, if you're interested we talked about finances and budgets and how God has is how Jesus is calling us to be faithful disciples around uh, those issues and we have podcasts you can go listen to that sermon uh, if you're uh, if you're interested um, this week I found myself drawn to this Isaiah chapter 5 passage and also the passage in Luke. It's always kind of cool when I can kind of like align the lectionary passages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, this is the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Luke passage. I came to bring a fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized and what stress am I under until it is completed? Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. He really goes into the detail here. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against uh, mother-in-law. And then the Isaiah passage. And, and Jesus comes and he says, you know, I have a baptism which to be baptized with. And part of the question that I'm asking today is, is what are we what are we being washed washed of? Um, what is God leading us from? I think is an important question. Also, what is God leading us into? And I think these are two critical questions um, uh, that really matter as we talk about cultivating space uh, for what uh, matters. Um, so today, I want to primarily focus on the Isaiah passage. Uh, this passage begins um, beautifully. Uh, uh, Let me sing a song to my beloved, uh, this beloved being Israel, the chosen ones. And it talks about how Israel was planted on a fertile hill, which was dug and cleared of stones, and then planted with choice vines. A watchtower was built to help protect the vineyard from thieves and animals. A huvat that was built uh, to yield these amazing grapes. Um, that uh, they had planted on this fertile hill. Um, I mean, it was a, it was picture perfect about what was about to happen with this bountiful crop, and it's going to be a delicious wine that was going to be used for celebrations, and and yet the outcome is that there's wild grapes that grew instead of their crop that couldn't be used for wine, and therefore their huvats, everything they had built up until this point, um, was useless. And it takes this dark turn where Isaiah says, um, I'll tell you what I want to do to my vineyard. I will remo remove its hedge, and it shall be dev devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. Um, and we get a glimpse of what was missing in this equation of their life together. <clears throat> he says, he expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Uh, we see this in Jesus' interaction um, with the Pharisees and Luke uh, when he was challenging about their tithe. Um, he was, you have this great religious discipline, uh, but you have neglected one thing, one essential thing, and that is justice. Um, what Isaiah is calling out uh, is that the Israelites did everything right, but they neglected one necessary thing, and that's social justice. I want to take some time today to break down like the biblical underpinnings of this theological um, concept of, of social justice, be, uh, because essentially that's what Isaiah says, you know, you did all this work to build this beautiful vineyard, and you had this expectation of this harvest, but uh, you neglected justice and righteousness. Now, the word for justice in Hebrew um, is, is mishpat, um, and I do not have great Hebrew pronunciation, so there it is. I, if I said it wrong, uh, 
You're judging me? Great. That's what I love about this congregation, um, is that you judge me. <laughs> um, justice is the ability to discern between what is evil and good. Um, this seems uh, arbitrary and relative uh, to each of us, what is, uh, what, what is evil and what might be good. When we, you start to talk about like restaurants, what restaurants do we like, what kind of coffee do we like, uh, our drinks, you know, we, we can, the, what is right and, and what is good and what is bad can become this relative thing. And we have lost this power in our society uh, to discern really between good and evil. Um, and, and our discerning has become so, um, uh, our discerning has, has just become like, we just put these arbitrary labels on things like, uh, you know, for some people, abortion, bad. Uh, for other people, abortion, good. Like, it just becomes like, it's that simple. You know, I can just call these singular issues, like, good or bad. Um, uh, but justice is this ability to discern. And when you talk about discernment, like, that's real brain brain work. And, and Isaiah is saying that Israel had lost the ability to, like, judge and about what is right and wrong and what is bad and good. Um, the, the outcome of justice is shalom, restoration, peace. Um, essentially, justice is about equal rights, making sure that everybody has a place at the table and making sure that everybody, uh, that not one person is given more and one is less, uh, uh, equal rights. All metaphors are, are limited in their scope and that might be a limited metaphor. But making sure justice is about making sure that people have equal rights afforded to them. And then there's this word righteousness, which is a, a word that is not about personal piety. Um, it's interesting to me that there is no um, place in the Hebrew scriptures to where righteousness is ever associated with a one person. It's a collective thing. It's a social thing. It's about a community that you always judged whether some whether somebody is doing right or wrong, not by that person, but in a social way, um, which is hard for us to understand because we're always thinking about our personal faith journey or our faith journey is private. Um, Oberry Hendricks defines righteousness this way. One's active dedication to the well-being of one's neighbor and the common good. The essence of righteousness is how we love and treat our neighbors. Um, it's, I, I think it's so simplistic in, in nature. It's about how am I treating those beside me. And, and that seems to be the common theme that when we think about the things we care about most, it's not just about our individual lives, it's about our collective lives. How am I caring about the well-being of others for the common good? And so righteousness and justice, righteousness being the social care of the well-being of others, and justice being this discernment between um, good and evil and how good how we are pursuing shalom uh, social justice becomes about um, and it has become this targeted word but it's about putting justice into practice for our neighbors and of course we could go into a spiel about who our neighbors are and, and for our purposes our neighbors are those who are on the margins who are voiceless in our society who are vulnerable the pursuit of social justice is the ever reminder that our salvation and our well-being is bound up together. And to pursue a life that is exclusionary and focused on one's own needs and well-being is antithetical to our faith. I think that is so vitally important uh, that we recognize uh, in our life together, um, not only in this body, but also in the places that we find ourselves, is this recognition that um, we can spend our lives fighting for our own rights, or we can spend our lives collectively cultivating space for the issues 
of others. Um, so Isaiah tells this back to Isaiah's story about cultivating margin for social justice and expected to yield a fruitful outcome, but instead it was a bad crop. Um, as a faith community, uh, and I have probably have had these individual conversations with a lot of you, people walk into this, this space or walk into any church and they're kind of judging, like, what is the spiritual depth of like the community? Uh, how well does this community pray? Is this community uh, aligned with all these you know, bullet points in my life? Um, um, how biblically, I, I mean, I think I read the Bible. Like, how, you know, is this a Bible believing church? Have you heard that language before? Are you a BBC? Um, I was like, I think I am. Like, I think I believe the Bible. Um, and we begin to, like, judge all these things by church. What is church? Yet when I read this text from Isaiah, I think God is looking for one clear thing among all those things. Do these people care about other people? <laughs> Period. And what Isaiah realized is that um, they had everything. Israel had everything, with the exception of care for other people, which is the one necessary thing. They had no social justice within them. When I hear Jesus saying, I, I have a baptism for which to be baptized, I feel like what he is saying is one that I am a person that has come to care about other people, and I wish other people would see that too. <laughs> um, one that hears the voice of the voiceless and doesn't just walk away, but actually listens, and doesn't just listen, then acts. We are finding ourselves continually called to reconciliation, to peace, to wholeness. These weren't meant to be burdens to carry, but instead what it means to follow in the wild and wonderful ways of Jesus. Like I said in the beginning, I think it's important to realize these are not separate things. These aren't like missional qualities to the faith, like this is our mission. No, this is center to who we are as a people with the issues we care about, whether it's women's rights or uh, housing for people, um, whatever it might be. I think these are the kind of things that are important and vital for us to be having conversations around and also talking about like where we're being intentional. Um, I think there's uh, this this reality in our life together, and you might have discovered this fairly quickly, is that we're not all passionate about the same things. Um, but it's also realizing, like, how can we collectively, um, a lot of these things are interconnected. How do we collectively support one another and place ourselves at tables uh, where real change uh, is happening? Um, the pursuit of social justice in our community and in our world, um, to me, uh, I think is about deep listening. It's about educating ourselves. Then I think it's about placing ourselves at tables to be advocates uh, for those who have no voice. I think there's many reasons why um, uh, we can sometimes not be pursuers of social justice. And I think even in the preaching of this sermon, I think, uh, I think well, any sermon for that matter is probably more of a sermon just for me uh, than it is for you. Um, because placing ourselves at tables, and especially when it comes to advocating for equal rights and justice for all people, is really exhausting work. And I know why. I know why church, churches and people want to talk about other things. <laughs> I know why, um, because it's disappointing work. Um, it's discomforting. Um, people don't listen to you. And I know the pathway for me has, has uh, become, uh, you know, I can become cynical and apathetic. And then I become despondent. Um, 
Jesus never um, Jesus never has has told any disciple that the way is easy. Never. <laughs> But in our 21st century Christianity, we want to make sure that we make Christianity seem easy and not exhausting and not disappointing and not discomforting. But the journey is arduous. It can be divisive, as Jesus um, said, and it can be extremely disappointed. Um, but the beauty in this journey is that it's a journey that we do together. Um, and this is the journey for which there's a harvest waiting at the end. A great feast. And the, cyn the cynical part of me just says, yeah, that's a pipe dream. But isn't that what we are leaning into hoping for, we have some sort of like hopeful image in front of us. We have some sort of constructed world um, where equality exists for all people and that we are chasing after that, where everyone has a place at the table, that everyone is fed a meal for which we all partake. And so the call today is, one, to affirm if you are at those tables and that you are trying to cultivate space for what matters is, is that you're doing the work God has called you to do. And it's beautiful work. Um, and it doesn't go unseen. But the other call is, is that, and this is maybe for me more than it is maybe for you, but is, is wherever you have been disappointed and if you're despondent or cynical, um, to lean in and to show up and to start to show up again um, because that's the good work we're all about and that when we do face disappointment um, we can know and rest assured that there is a community waiting to hold us to affirm us to encourage us and to send us right back and all God's people said Amen Will I invite us uh, to recite uh, together our invitation?